Our gospel lesson for today is from the Good News According to St. Matthew, chapter 9. We're on page 11 in the New Testament portion of your pew Bibles. Chapter 9, beginning at the 35th verse, with the subheading that reads, The harvest is great, the laborers few. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment. Give without payment. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Before I go on with the rest of my sermon based on today's gospel lesson, I want to remind you of the context of it. Where has Jesus come? What's been going on in the Gospel of Matthew leading up to today's lesson? And you may recall that Jesus' public ministry, his mission, begins following his baptism by John in the Jordan River. And right away, Matthew tells us that Jesus goes about teaching and healing and being with the people in need, and that great crowds begin to follow him. The crowds are following him as he goes up on the mountain and gives the Sermon on the Mount. And when he gets all done with teaching the people, we are told that the people are just awestruck because he teaches as one having authority. And then Matthew shares with us several stories about healing. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he takes people who are blind and gives them sight, people who are lame and they walk, people who have leprosy, the skin disease, and they are healed, people who are possessed by evil spirits, and he casts those demons out. And he even raises people who have died from the dead. In fact, a story about a young girl who dies precedes our gospel lesson for today, that he raises her. It is into this context, then, of all of his miraculous healings and his great teaching and the crowds following him all along the way that our lesson for today comes. You know, we live in a world that is not easily impressed, and I wonder if Jesus was doing these things today publicly, walking around and all of these miracles, would we crowd around him? I don't know. Perhaps we would. But in Jesus' day, he was the hot topic. He was the one that everybody wanted to see, either to be healed themselves or to see what he would do next. Jesus looks at this vast crowd of people, and he gets a sense of, what can I do among so many? He says that the people appear to be sheep who are harassed without a shepherd. I was thinking, when have I seen that? When have you seen crowds of people who look 
as if they're lost without a leader. Immediately, the picture came to mind for me of people who are refugees currently, needing to leave their homeland because of war, carrying their possessions with them, looking for a place to be safe. In my mind's eye also was the television news reports following 9-11, when the crowds of people are walking away from the smoldering buildings. Or after Hurricane Katrina, when all of the people went to the Superdome in downtown New Orleans. Or perhaps following the tsunami. Think of those kinds of images and that feeling that we have when we see those sorts of things. What can we possibly do? Jesus, the human side of Jesus, looks at this crowd and says, What is one among so many? What can I do for all of these people? And so he turns to his disciples and he says, Ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Notice that it's his harvest. It's not as if this is an accident, somehow just a bunch of wild fruit that's ripe and needs to be picked. It's not because of the effort of any human being. It is because of God's good plan, the Creator, who has made all of these people, but who don't know whose they are, that they don't know that they're children of God, that they are loved, and that they are cared for. Something very interesting happens here. Jesus turns the disciples, who are students, disciple means student, suddenly into the apostles. This is the first time the word appears in Matthew's gospel. Apostle literally means the sent one. And so these are the ones who he sends out to do his work. God wants this help. God doesn't really need their help. God is fully capable of accomplishing God's good mission and purposes without the help of human beings, but God chooses to use human beings to participate in the mission. God wants them to experience the real joy, the real sense of purpose and meaning in life that only comes by serving others. When I was about 12, my dad had an idea to hire me for a job he wanted to have done. The truth is, my dad didn't really need my help, but he chose to let me help. He saw a great opportunity for me to learn a valuable skill and to accomplish a big chore that he knew I could be successful at. Our garage needed to be painted. And so my dad took the time to teach me how to scrape, prep, and clean the surface. He taught me how to properly apply the primer and then the finish coat of paint. He taught me how to clean the brushes and take care of them and store them, and he taught me how to be safe on a ladder. He could have done the job himself, and he could have done it in a lot less time than it took me. He could have hired a contractor to do it. He had plenty of money to do that. Or he could have bartered with one of the many customers who came to our automotive repair shop where he could have done work on their vehicle and they could have done the painting. But instead, he was willing to ask me to do the job so that I could learn and grow as I did that task. He was willing to let me overcome the challenges to find out how to take care of a building, willing to let me know that my efforts would be of value to him and to our entire family. So these disciples, these students, have been following Jesus. He's been teaching them along the way, but they are still quite young, very wet behind the ears, very inexperienced, And yet there's important work to be done, and Jesus knows they can do it. They may not know it yet, but he knows that they can do it. And God sends through Jesus the message to them that they are valuable, that they can share in this labor, in this mission, and that they can experience the joy that Jesus knows at helping others. 
Long ago, I heard a great preacher say something that has stuck with me for many, many years. He said, we cannot, as Jesus followers, all become famous, because not all of us can be well known. But all of us can be great, because each of us can serve. You know, the world and the forces of evil deliver the message to us over and over and over again every single day that you are the only one who matters. Take care of me, myself, and I. You are the most important. Don't worry about anyone else. Take care of yourself. That will make you happy. That will make you successful. Well, I'm here to tell you that God tells us those voices of evil are simply wrong. When you worship you and you alone, that is a dead-end idolatry that is simply fatal. God's call, God's invitation today, is that we give ourselves away, that we give ourselves away and strive to share Christ's love with everyone everywhere, and when we do so, we will experience an authentic joy, a sense of peace, and a sense of purpose in life that can't come through any other efforts. In another gospel lesson, following this same sending out of the disciples, now apostles, they return to Jesus and they are so excited to tell him what they have done. The people that they have cured and helped the people whose lives that they have touched and have touched them. And Jesus responds, I know. I saw Satan fall from heaven. You know, it's funny. All these years later, I know that my dad paid me for painting the garage, but that's not what I remember. I don't remember the money. What I remember is my dad walking with me around the garage, looking at it, and turning to me and saying, you did a great job. Now, I'm sure there were mistakes. There were probably drips and runs and things that could have been done better that probably I've improved on over the years when I paint. But what I remember was the glow and the pride in my dad's face that I had done something that helped Today is a call and an invitation to remind us that God wants to be proud of us and to share in that joy as we are laborers for God's harvest. The truth is that there are a lot of people out there who are chipped and peeling, a lot of people whose lives are neglected. A lot of people who do not know the joy and the love and the peace that you and I have experienced because we know Jesus. And so God invites all of us to join in this wonderful work, this ministry, this mission, this labor, to carry God's love and mercy, God's grace and forgiveness, God's hope and healing to a world so sorely in need. There is much to be done. Will you join me in that work? In the name of Jesus, amen.